Hello everyone, welcome to the Masterclass on Theology and Psychology. I'm pleased you've decided to join us and I hope that our time together actually helps stimulate your thinking and indeed enables you in whatever ministry God has called you towards. Often theology and psychology can be seen at two ends of a spectrum. Um, some people consider uh, psychology to be evil or of the devil. Um, people in psychology consider people who are Christians and believers as maybe lacking a few brain cells and, and not quite all there. We don't need to have these polarised positions actually. What we can do is actually have wisdom and learn from one another. So hopefully today we'll unpack some of the thinkings behind theology and psychology and how we can constructively learn from the other. And towards the end, I'll give you some uh, concrete applications as to how I see theology and psychology can come together to enable uh, more effective and more wise ministry. In brief, psychologists need to recognise that their view of the world is limited. They've, people all have a worldview, and though we may not always recognise the foundations of it, it does colour the way we, we see and think about everything around us. Many psychologists who come from a secular, humanistic, um, rationalistic worldview see anything to do with faith, the spiritual, as uh, nonsensical and uh, not worthy of consideration. Whereas Christians need to learn that there are some things that we can learn from those who aren't Christian, even those who don't believe in God and the spiritual in the way we do. In fact, many Christians use psychological insights even though we don't recognise that we're doing as such because the um, learnings of psychology have shaped a lot of the way we think about ourselves, how we relate to other people, how we do teamwork, how we lead. It shaped our society in so many ways that actually we, we can be unaware of it. So as I said, an important question we need to consider is how we think about reality, our world view. It's one of those things that often we don't stop to think about and we can be like a fish in water. You know, the fish doesn't realise it's in water and it's just the place it lives. Our worldview is the intellectual place we live. It's part of our mental furniture and we often don't stop to think about it. And it's actually a really helpful place to go at times to say, what are my assumptions? What are the, the, the underlying ways I think about truth and fact? and evidence and all these sorts of things that come together to influence how we weigh something up, how we value something. Christians and psychologists can be guilty of not being aware of their assumptions, their worldview. So I'm not trying to pick on anyone here, any one group in particular, because we all can fall afoul of this um, lack of careful thinking about our world. So. To start with, I'm going to go through some of the common worldviews because it's really helpful because it helps us understand ourselves and other people when we're having discussions with them or we're reading something they may have written, a book, an article, um, even a newspaper article. So four common worldviews I'm going to pick on are material naturalism, secular humanism, pantheism and the Judeo-Christian worldview. So, Let's briefly summarise these four. The first one is material naturalism. And in material naturalism, only scientifically verifiable statements can present us with truth. If you can't verify it by scientific um, experimentation, you develop a hypothesis, you test it, you refine it, you prove or disprove it, then you develop a new hypothesis, you test it and so on. If you can't use this empirical methodology to prove something, then something isn't true. This worldview has a limitation in that it confuses fact and truth. And while a fact may be true, not all truths can necessarily be proved as fact. 
people in this worldview can sometimes fall afoul of the, the limitation that they don't recognise this is actually a belief system. Yes, fact and experimental evidence are important. Please don't get me wrong with that. I'm, I'm all in favour of testing what we know and including doing that in ministry to see if what we do works. You know, if we measure something, we can say, did that have an impact? Is the way we're, we're treating someone in counselling, um, is that helping? Is our strategy for reaching out to people working? Is our way of persuading people about God effective? You know, we measure all these things. And so in that way, this empirical approach is not bad at all. But those who rely on that only have this as actually a worldview with its own set of assumptions. One of the, the bottom line assumptions here is that everything that exists can be reduced down to matter, energy, physical laws and processes. The challenge here is that this also includes things like human consciousness and religious belief. You know, so are we, as a, as a person, are we only chemical processes in the brain, well, that's how some of these people see the world. They may not realise they do it. Some actually do realise they do it and say, yeah, that's quite valid. But some others, and I'm not just talking theists here, atheists will challenge this worldview and say, that's not enough because it doesn't allow us to examine some truths that actually say scientific method can't examine. So and they're often truths about meaning and purpose, let alone questions of that, um, are we more than just a physical lump of, of um, chemicals that, that have electrical impulses? Is a being more than the processes that support that being? Are we a soul, in other words, rather than just a physical being? Some who study the psychology of religion come from this perspective and they think uh, of religion purely as uh, a series of uh, psychological events and nothing more, that there's nothing spiritual in it. However, you may recognise that this belief is an unverifiable assumption. How can you prove that there is nothing more, that there is nothing spiritual if your evidence doesn't allow for any proof that can't be measured? We can't measure God. We may be able to measure God's influence. We may be able to uh, see the effect of God's spirit doing something in the world around us. We may feel God doing something in us, but we can't actually measure that. We can see the effects, but not the reality behind it. Because God is, by definition, in my worldview, beyond and includes the, the physical world, but is also beyond it. The spiritual is something beyond the physical. Some philosophers actually note that this is a, a limited worldview and reduction. So again, this isn't, um, and it can sound a bit like this is science versus religion, but it's not just that because there are a number of atheist writers and um, philosophers who would actually say this worldview is limited as well. Um, and they would argue that mind or consciousness is more than brain chemistry, for example, leaving God out of it, saying being a person is more than just the, the chemical processes, the electrical processes going on in the brain. So material naturalism has some useful things to offer, but as a worldview, um, some would argue it's limited. Secular humanism is like an extension of material naturalism and and it's the dominant worldview, I would suggest, in our society today. And in this way of looking at the world, humans, people give meaning and shape to their own lives. Basically, people, humans stand at the centre of the, the world in this, this way. Reason therefore becomes reliable and just enough to govern life both as individuals and collectively. In other words, reason, the way we think about things, the ways we can think things out, becomes the measure of what is right and just and true. And you may see this in some of our current society where um, ethics feeds into this discussion. How do you judge what is right and what is wrong? Well, if our rationality, our way of thinking about it, is the measure, 
then we'll see what's happened even in my lifetime where ethical norms shift as people think about things differently. There are no ethical absolutes. Ethics becomes what seems most reasonable and rational at the time. And if we don't have um, immovable starting assumptions, if we don't have absolutes in an ethical sense, and it's all about the way we think, then as our starting assumptions change, so do our ending conclusions. There is an inherent optimism in this worldview, and don't get me wrong, optimism is not a bad thing. It's actually good to think positively. But the optimism here is based in humanity's ability to create the perfect world. And those of you who are maybe um, more in my age group or a bit of a, a television buff and watch some of the old television series, and particularly if you're a science fiction buff, you'd be aware of the original Star Trek series you know, with Leonard Nimoy, um, William Shatner and others in it. And you see this worldview actually portrayed really clearly in that television series. Um, if you ever want to explore worldviews and the way people think, have a look at contemporary fictional um, media. It's a great way to get behind um, people's thinking because in fiction, these things can be explored um, in interesting ways. So here in Star Trek, we see that this wonderful future is created because people grew up enough, and that's my um, description, but you notice that's sort of the theme, that humans as a society matured enough, their science led them into enlightenment enough so that wars and evil and everything else really was pretty much abolished, though what I do find interesting watching the, the series is there's still the, the subtext of fallen humanity, people doing the wrong thing. So whilst society is perfect, people are not, and there's an interesting tension there. And in this worldview, um, civic and moral norms are achieved by consensus. Um, though more recently, I would argue that possibly by the loudest voice rather than consensus, because I think with the way social media has gone and the way media reacts to things nowadays is the, the voices we hear the most are those that are the loudest rather than the, the, the majority. So some would say consensus does it. I, I would suggest maybe that's a little simplistic, but nevertheless, because people are the focus here, it's people's views that determine what is right and wrong. So there are overlaps with naturalism here, um, where there is still this concern with the empirical method, measurement, scientific experimentation as the way to know things, and really the only way to know things. And in this worldview, and this is where we see it quite clearly in Australia at times, religious belief is private and not to become part of the public square, public discussion. And I found it really interesting a few times in the media over the last few uh, decades even, where I've heard uh, phrases from the church, like the separation of church and state, where the church should not be too closely associated with um, the, the wider um, power structures because it influences the church in a bad way. That was the church's position, now being taken up by society saying the church and state should be separate, i.e. you shouldn't have religious figures in the public square. And we see that more recently with Scott Morrison's um, religious worldview becoming a key issue in whether he should be prime minister or not, or how much it should influence what he does, as though someone's values, regardless of who they are, whether they're religious or not, doesn't influence how they lead politically or whatever. And so it's a, you, see, you hear how that worldview asks a question another worldview would ask very differently. And as I said, this is probably the dominant Western worldview, secular humanism. Another common worldview is pantheism. And this one moves in the spectrums to allow to a spiritual reality. And here, the core reality isn't the physical, measurable world, but the core reality is spirit or um, you know, the, the, um, something that's spiritual, wh whether the spirit is personal or not, because that's a, a key issue here. The spirit, these um, 
people with this belief system talk about isn't the spirit Christians were talking about, which is a personal spirit, it's much more of an impersonal force. Um, but this spiritual reality is where physical reality comes from. So the underlying reality is spiritual and the physical reality sits on top of that and is part of that. There are two ways people think in this realm. One is um, pantheism where all is God. Everything is spiritual, everything is holy and everything is part of God. The other one is panentheism, and a very slight change in spelling and pronunciation, where all is in God. So one, God is everything, and the other one, everything is in God. And there's slightly different emphases there. Um, one, we are divine, the other, we're not, is really one of the key differences there. But the big issue here is that the spiritual is an impersonal force, not a personal um, being of any sort. Uh, one recent advocate of this, uh, some of you who were around um, particularly in the 90s might be aware of and you'll, you'll probably read a bit about him, but he created a bit of a stir in the church in the Western world and he visited Australia and so on was Bishop John's, John Spong. And he was purportedly a Christian, a, a, an Episcopalian bishop from the US, but in reality he was a pantheist. You know, he had God being this impersonal force and Jesus was just an enlightened teacher and so on. So he was, I would argue, wasn't a Christian because he, he violated some of the basic orthodox Christian beliefs. And when you read what he, he spoke about, he had this spiritual reality that reminded me something like the force in Star Wars and the force in Star Wars forms in, falls into this pantheistic uh, worldview where it's this, this non-physical reality that impacts on the physical but it's not a being as such. So we see this worldview um, in other world religions as well but we also see it reflected in times in Western society. Judeo-Christianity however is different because we think that the ultimate reality is spiritual, same as pantheism, but there is one Holy Spirit above any other spiritual reality. Now notice the way I say that, because I would argue that we don't see there is a one spiritual reality, but there is a spiritual reality. God is spirit, but there are other spiritual realities, and we would talk about evil spirits and so on as well. And, so do, and why do we do that? Because scripture does, okay? Um, bottom line is scripture's authoritative for us. In our worldview, unlike some in pantheism where who can dismiss the physical world, the physical world is actually important and significant because God created a good creation which he gave to um, humanity to not only care for but to enjoy. Um, a quick sidetrack, but it's, I think it's helpful to understand this. The, the Jewish worldview actually um, says we will be judged by God for how much we enjoyed the good creation he gave us. And... Christians can sometimes be too influenced by material naturalism and humanism and dismiss the world, the physical world. We can be a bit, um, uh, what's the word I'm after, dualistic in this, where we separate spiritual and physical, whereas I think a, holist, a, a truly Christian and Jewish worldview is holistic, where the spiritual and the physical are together and all is good because all is created by God. And, you know, whilst sin is there causing problems, making you know, um, the world not the perfect world it was created, it is still a good creation and we should be valuing it as such. So the spiritual world interacts with the physical world and they're in some ways you know, intertwined and inseparable rather than separate. And some, like I said, some of our, our Christian thinking can be influenced by other worldviews, including... Um, for example, the Greek worldview where the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. That dualism is not Christian, let me say. And if you read scripture, we don't go to be with God in heaven forevermore. We, we exist in a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. And by the way, biblically speaking, heavens and earth is, is a, a way of saying everything, a new everything where God comes to dwell with his people. Read the book of Revelation again and you'll see that that's actually how it's described. Now, the physical world here is seen as logical and rational because it was created by a logical and rational God. And by the by, the scientific method 
was largely championed by believers, um, I think, was it Bacon was one of those? And there are others um, who went looking for the logic and rationality behind creation because they thought God would have actually created something that made sense and we could learn about it. And we were given rational thinking to understand God, each other and the creation around us. So the, everything fits together in a coherent way. Here, science and logic are ways of knowing, but they're not the only or the ultimate ways of knowing. They're not the limit of knowing. You know, we can know beyond the, the scientific because the, the, there is this spiritual reality as well. And here, right and wrong are not abstract, but elements of reality tied to a God who is good. And this is why we, we get upset when things are not good, because we think, if God, why would we get upset when bad things happen if we didn't expect good to happen? You, you get the, the, the point that it's only because we believe in a, a God who is good that we get upset by injustice. So this infects our whole worldview, our way of thinking about what is right and what is wrong. And here we can combine knowledge and truth with wisdom. And I think it's no accident that one of the three parts of the Hebrew scriptures is the wisdom literature, telling us that knowledge isn't everything, but actually the application of knowledge, i.e. wisdom, is a core thing we need to have. And if anything, you may see, that's one of the subtexts I have today, is this idea of being wise in the way we uh, put together truth and fact, knowledge and um, understanding. So if you um, think about it, there is this world views of pantheism, secular humanity, material naturalism, and in many ways Christianity overlaps with all three. And you know, we, I, I've, I've played a little bit with a, an illustration you'll see where I've played with the Trinity of Father, Son and Spirit with these three worldviews and you, you'll see them overlapping. But that's because with our worldview, with um, the spiritual and the physical, we do incorporate elements of all these worldview. And so we shouldn't see them as threatening in some respects, but as places where we can gain wisdom and knowledge. Why should we, we approach it this way and not be antagonistic? Well, because even our own scriptures, we have truth and wisdom from other people. Um, you might think of the, the wisdom of the, the Roman centurion looking at Jesus dying and saying, surely this man was a son of God. Um, and he may not have understood it fully, but he saw something deeper than many of his, his, the Jesus' Jewish countrymen saw. Uh, we can go to the Psalms and the Proverbs and we see them written by people who weren't Jews, but were incorporated into the, the Jewish scriptures, our scriptures, because they had wisdom and truth in them. I mean, even Cyrus, a non-believer, foreign um, leader, is someone who God could use. So, you know, sometimes we, I think we draw too hard a boundaries about where we can gain wisdom, knowledge and understanding. And we need to open those boundaries a bit and be wise, because that's the key phrase. So it's important to recognise that Empiricism and rationality aren't anti-Christian. Okay, we don't need to check our brains at the door when we become a Christian. We can actually keep our brains and use them as they are enlightened by the Spirit as well. So it's not either or, it's both and. As I said, the roots of scientific inquiry are in this belief in a rational God. And many people are actually are able to be science uh, sci scientists and believe in God. Um, a friend of mine is a, an atomic physicist and also a biblical scholar. And he firmly believes in God and the spiritual reality of God, but also believes in the, the, the truths he's found studying atomic physics. We create this false dichotomy. We don't understand the whole of creation when we separate them. Something is true because it is. Now, it may sound ridiculously obvious, 
But the trouble is we often reject something as true because it doesn't fit with our worldview or our own assumptions. And what we need to do is to be wise and to understand things um, by asking good questions. Fact doesn't encompass all truth. Fact and truth are not the same, though they do overlap. But neither does faith encompass all truth. You know, we didn't learn about electricity that we're using to record this and all sorts of electronic by faith. We learned it by experimenting and delving into the creation as God designed it and learning some of the principles behind it. In general, turning to psychologists now and being more specifically focused there, psychologists are concerned with understanding people, both individuals and groups. And the goal of psychology is really to reduce dysfunction and to increase well-being. And if we look at it from that perspective, then we, I'm sure, can agree because actually that's our goals as the people of God. We want to introduce people to to God in Christ because that actually reduce, uh, repairs the damage done by sin, that separation from God. And we also do things like pastoral care and social service because we're concerned for the whole person. We want to bring them shalom as it's described, wholeness um, in the Hebrew scriptures. So in that respect, we actually can say we agree on an awful lot that we want people to be more whole and to live a more... Um, effective, fulfilled, healthy life. We can think about um, psychology. It's got a number of different fields and some of those are closer to or maybe further away, away from where we think. Many people have this parody of, of psychology linking it with Freud and psychoanalysis, but that's only one part of it. And by the way, in my list of articles you can read later, there was a, a news magazine type article that uh, reveals the, the interesting truth that in psychology, proper academic psychology that people study, Freud is probably paid a lot less attention than he is in the popular media and, and uh, movies and things like that. There's behaviourism. Why do people do the way they, things they do? How can we learn about people from what, watching their behaviours? And we see this turning up in things like um, personality profiles, behavioural profiles, and they can be useful tools to helping ourselves understand each other in teams and understand ourselves and things like this. Cognitive psychology, how do we understand people by learning how they think? And, you know, often one of the most common ways of helping people in um, counselling and clinical situations is based on cognitive psychology. It's... Um, basically changing the way we think, changes the way we feel, and changes the way we behave. Why? Because we're an integrated person. We don't exist as a mind apart from our body, apart from our emotions, and therefore working on the way we think helps the way we feel and actually helps our well-being physically and all sorts of things. One of the areas I um, studied when I was uh, training for ministry, um, I had the opportunity to do some psychology as part of my studies many years ago was developmental psychology and I chose to do that because I saw that actually understanding how people grow from infancy through to old age, what the issues are, what the key characteristics are of various stages in life actually can inform my ministry and help me understand and it was, I, I still remember in my, my first associate ministry um, I had a mother coming to talk about the clinginess of a child and I'd studied that I hadn't had children at that time, but that gave me an insight into what might be going on and it, it actually really helped. Um, it helped in having teenage children. My children are now in adulthood, but um, knowing that rebellion is part of the process of forming identity and there are different ways people do that and why does rebellion occur? It's not just because my children are being horrible and evil or this becomes input we can give to people in pastoral situations where knowing what's going on in life, knowing what's going on in people, what the issues might be, because we're informed by the learnings of, of uh, psychology, we can actually say this could be part of the picture. Now, because we actually have a broader worldview than psychology, we may also bring other things in, like we know that evil is real. We know that sin affects 
the human condition. And these are things which actually the psychological worldview doesn't bring in. So we, they um, may expect people to, you, you fix the environment and you fix the person, that people are good because the environment is good. And actually there's historically been some experiments along those lines and tragically they are failed. Whereas we can say, actually, we know people will never be perfect this side of eternity because of the presence and power of sin. And we can also ask questions. I, I was uh, only in a discussion the other week where I said to someone, this could be going on, it could be about the situation, but maybe there's something spiritual going on here as well. And it's a question we can ask because we have this different worldview that someone who's got a secular humanistic worldview would not ask, would think it's an invalid question or not even think to ask the question. Let me touch on a, an important um, example I see from time to time in terms of mental health. Um, mental health is one of those issues that many people find difficult to deal with. In my very life, I've, I've worked as a, a nurse as well as a, a pastor, and I've had to nurse people with mental health conditions. And it can be really difficult to know how to relate to someone who doesn't see reality in the same way you do. And often you'll find people leaning back, dis, you know, physically trying to distance themselves because of the discomfort. We can say sometimes there's a spiritual reality maybe to mental dysfunction. But I would not say that all mental dysfunction is due to spiritual realities. And this is where wisdom is needed. Um, a great person to read, and he's on your, your reading list, I believe, is Archibald Hart, Arch Hart, uh, from Fuller Seminary. He's a psychologist who, who teaches at Fuller, and he's written and thought a lot in this area. And he talks about depression in one of his books. And he makes, the, I think, a really important point that depression is not always due to sin, whereas some Christians think in those terms that, oh, you're down, therefore it's due to sin in your life or demonic oppression or something like that. Now, let me say it can be, but let me also say it doesn't have to be. Why? Because depression is a natural response to emotional wounding. If we get physically wounded, then we have inflammation occur. Inflammation is the body's response to tissue damage and it helps um, get the, the blood supply go going and, and various uh, things happening that will help that damage be repaired. Similarly, one understanding of depression is that it's that response to emotional damage that causes us to step back, to withdraw so that we can collect our psychological and emotional resources to deal with the challenge we've just faced. One of these we would all experience from time to time would be grief. And it's fairly common for sadness and even a level of depression to occur in grief because emotionally, psychologically, we've been wounded by the, the loss we've experienced. Now, that's not to say that um, there isn't a spectrum here. And, and think this is one of the, the traps we can easily fall into is we can be very loose in our use of terminology. And so when we say depression, people think automatically of the extreme of clinical depression. And there is that, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But also there's just mild sadness that again causes us to withdraw and take emotional um, stock. And one of the things you notice when you work with people, and one of my areas of, of interest is emotional intelligence, and so the focus on emotions, is that the spiritual, the physical, the emotions, all of these tie in together. I remember a friend of mine who was undergoing cancer treatment, and he said whenever he had had his chemotherapy, inevitably a few days later as sort of the effects of those very strong chemicals um, impacted on him. Physically, he was absolutely toast. But also emotionally he was, spiritually he was. He said it was a really dark time and he could map the patterns in um, relation to when he was being treated. Sometimes 
things are physical. You know, depression can be clinical. And depression can be caused by, in these cases, chemicals being wrong in the brain. Just like diabetes is caused by um, an absence of insulin and we, we can treat that, or a reduced amount of insulin, let me say, to be a bit more precise. We can treat that with um, tablets or injections and in very mild cases with diet. And again, you've got that spectrum. Similarly with depression. Sometimes the, the brain chemistry is wrong. And yes, in one way, this is a result of sin. The fact that we live in a fallen world and I don't want to take that lightly, but it's not necessarily that person's sin that's causing it. It's just the fact that they live in a body that's not perfect working the way it should. So sometimes the treatment is to bring things back to the way they should be and, and sometimes pharmacological drugs um, are useful and necessary. I also know of people who've experienced bullying, for example, and in extreme cases, we can actually now with current technology show that the brain changes. We talk about neuroplasticity and we can see how the brain changes because of events like trauma, including things like bullying. And sometimes in severe cases, you actually treat people with medication to help the brain chemistry to return back to normal. So the brain can return to normal and then the person doesn't need it anymore. Some Christians get really concerned about things like this and we'll either say it's not real or it's all spiritual. Whereas I think we need to think more holistically, more wisely to recognise that we can't separate who we are as spiritual beings from who we are as a physical being because we inhabit this body we live in. And as I said with my friend who was going through cancer treatment, the physical impacts of the drugs had an impact on his emotional and spiritual well-being. Similarly, we know that if someone is in a good place spiritually, they will tend to be healthier and have better an emotional well-being as well. All of these things interact. And my plea is that we actually become wise in how we think about these things and we take these learnings from the fields of psychology, everything from, like I just mentioned, neuropsychology and brain mapping through to how we can be more effective in counselling. How, how do we lead teams is one of the areas I sometimes contribute to and that is something which psychologists study in social psychology. How do you lead effectively? Well, actually, there's no one good answer to that because we found that context and the, the environment, that is, and the people involved all have impacts. And so in some situations, like in a crisis situation, an authoritarian, very directive method is really very appropriate. If you've got the building burning down, you, you don't say, um, can we have a talk about how we're going to execute our safety protocols here? No, you want to tell people, get up, get out. It's about safety. Whereas if you're leading a team to engage in a creative process, what you, tr you need to do is to allow for um, a permission giving form of leadership where people's creativity gets allowed to flow. And maybe you use some of the psychological learning that says actually less words, more pictures, because the whole left and right brain stuff we, we understand um, where parts of our brain are more verbal, others are not. And sometimes the non-verbal enables us to think in a different way. So drawing pictures and music and, and that creative side can sometimes help get over what sometimes the, the verbal side doesn't. But let me also say that then the whole thing of, of learning styles comes into it. And I hope you see, I'm just providing example after example. You know, I'm actually not a, an artistic, creative person. I draw stick figures and they're as good as it gets. But I learn that I learn by talking and I think by talking. So when I get stuck, I find someone I can talk to about a problem I need to think through. But if we didn't know this, if we didn't know that people learned and thought differently, then we would all tend to, to assume that people do things the same as us. So a friend of mine, he thinks by, uh, in pictures. So when he gets stuck, I get him in front of a whiteboard with some uh, whiteboard markers and we talk it out by drawing diagrams and things like that. 
As you can see, the examples go on and on. I hope they tend, these have tended to, to whet your appetites a little bit. We need to use these two areas of thinking, our theological thinking about what reality is, who God is, good, evil, ethics, spiritual realities, and tie it in with what we can learn about people as individuals, people in groups, people as they grow and develop, all these areas of learnings that are there in the, the field of psychology and put them together so that we, as the people of God, can be even more effective in our mission in ministry. I hope this has been uh, stimulating and also beneficial to you all. I look forward to the discussions that follow in our Q&A time.